The preamble is an introduction. And what the introduction is intended to do is to say, okay, here's the things that we're going to talk about here in the Constitution, and then when they get to the body after the introduction, these are the ways that you do them. Are we really supposed to believe that when they were talking about general welfare, what they really were talking about were giant entitlement programs, free health care for all, free college education, all of that stuff, and the founders just kind of forgot to put that in there, even though they put it in the introduction, they just somehow, oh, slipped my mind, I forgot all those giant social programs we were supposed to put in there. That's not realistic. When they say the general welfare, they're talking about the things that are in the Constitution. <laughs> Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. As you know, it is Constitution Day, as you can tell by my big fancy background here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into some Constitu Constitution Day stuff, of course, on this day, September the 17th on 1789, which would be 233 years ago. Man, that uh, makes you feel old, doesn't it? <laughs> the Constitution is 233 years old. So anyway, um, 233 years ago it was signed, not ratified, that's important to note. This is the day that it was signed, that the Constitutional Committee decided that their work was worthy of preserving and bringing forward to the American people. It was not ratified on this day. It was merely signed, and the ratification process would take several years. That's why we don't have a presidential election until 1789, despite the fact that the Constitution was signed in 1787. And so that may be why some people might look at back at this and be a little confused, like, wait a second, but George Washington didn't take office until 1790. Yeah, well, that's why. It took a long time to convince the states that this Constitution was ready for ratification. This was a very vigorous debate. You know, I think we sometimes romanticize some of the ideas of the founding and the, the coming together of the Constitution, and it is a great moment in history, don't get me wrong. It is one of the greatest moments in history, if you want my opinion on it. But sometimes we make the mistake of romanticizing it to the point that we think, oh, all the founders came together and had all these great ideas, and they all agreed, and then they wrapped it up in a couple days, and everything was good. That's not how it happened, folks. The Constitutional Convention lasted for the entire summer and a little bit longer. They argued for this for several months. At one point, it got so contentious that they were planning to just break the whole thing off. They were going to go back and just continue to live under the Articles of Confederation. It was only because of Benjamin Franklin, and oddly enough, despite him not being a terribly religious person himself, one of the ones who suggested that and made the call to all the delegates assembled there to come together and start praying and have a daily prayer by one of the local chaplains to come in from one of the local congregations in the churches and pray over this, that they started to come together, they started to compromise, and I think a lot of that had to do with them being aware of the fact of the, the importance of their work and how it was going to affect other people, and also just because I, I think that there was some divine providence involved in that as well. So those are some important details to note in our story, but I think that because I go over this every year and, and I think about different things to do for Constitution Day for the 4th of July with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. I try to do a show for the Bill of Rights every day or every year for, for Bill of Rights Day. So I always try to think about it because that's important to note, too, that the Bill of Rights didn't come until much later. So the Bill of Rights, of course, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, still part of the Constitution, don't get me wrong. But they're not really commemorated on this day because this is the day that the, the body of the Constitution, the first uh, seven articles of the Constitution, were put together. And so uh, that's really what we're talking about here today. And I thought about all the different things that I could do, the different things that I could go over. And especially, and I think it's so important now more than ever to do this because our Constitution is largely unappreciated. It's come under attack by so many different sources. And so I think a really good place to start when that is happening is instead of diving into the intricacies of the separation of powers, which I certainly love doing, and I know that you, my audience, since you guys are, are constitutional nerds like me, you probably would enjoy that quite a bit as well. I get that there's value in that, and that's usually something that I do, but I think maybe it's time for us to get back to basics and on the things that unite us, and that's the reason why I decided that this year I would just go with reading the preamble and going through sort of an introduction to that, because that's what the preamble is. Ultimately, the preamble is an introduction. 
And when you think of introductions, what do introductions do? If you were, for example, to sit down and write a speech and you had a message to convey to people, you would start with your introduction. And one of the things that you would do in your introduction is tell the people why they are there, why you are meeting, why you are putting this thing together, and that's what our founders did too. They put inside the preamble, okay, this is who's gathering, this is why we're meeting, this is the purpose of this document, these are the things that we're going to go over in this document, and then they do a, a quick little closeout in the last part of the preamble, and so they, they fit a lot into a very small space in the preamble to the Constitution, so let's go ahead and read that now. And try not to hum along the Schoolhouse Rock version in your head. I know I certainly do. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty, to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And there's just so much in that to go over, and we're going to go over it point by point. Uh, first of all, it's more specific and more tangible than the Declaration of Independence. Because remember, the Declaration of Independence, that's our mission statement. That's our goal. But it's all idealism. There's nothing concrete about it. It doesn't form a government. Now, it's important, and it is the basis upon which our Constitution is written. But ultimately, we have to remember that the Declaration of Independence... That's basically just missions and goals. It doesn't tell you how to get there. It just says this is the kind of country that we want to make. The Constitution was the first attempt to actually make that into something tangible and something that was realistic. And so the preamble attempts to do that. It has those same principles that the Declaration of Independence does, but it broadens them out and gives them some kind of effectiveness. It, it makes them real in some sense because it talks about the things that the founders believed that government was supposed to do. So first of all, it starts out with the who. Who is doing this? Well, that's pretty obvious. You can see it in the background right behind me. We the people. What was so different about this, and, and we almost gloss over it because it's so familiar to us now. When this happened, when this happened in 1787, it was a radically new idea that people would come together and form a government. There were governments that existed on earth at the time that did have representation. That is a thing that happened. Britain had its parliament. But in that case, it wasn't the people that came together and formed the government. The kings and the heads of, of different tribes came together and formed a coalition to where you had the king and then you had the lords and the commoners and then that evolved eventually into having a representative body that had some power in the government, but the origin was still the king. You still had monarchy. And that was true of all of the known civilized nations in the world. You had some, for example, in the Middle East that still had tribal rule where there were tribal leaders and heads of families and whatnot. But there was never a government in the history of mankind that came together originally with a representative body like that. The closest that they ever came was Rome, but even then that was something that wasn't originally started in Rome. Rome had a government preceding that. America was completely different because we just came together as the people and decided how we should be governed. And so the who is incredibly important. Then they go into the why. The why is in order to form a more perfect union. This kind of just seems like fluffy words that sound pretty to us today, but they're not if you know the context. You see, for 10 years, America had lived under the Articles of Confederation, which did kind of loosely tie the states together, but realistically, we weren't a country. We were several individual countries that just sort of had a contract with one another to not, you know, go in and kill one another. And that's about all it was. Uh, the, the Articles of Confederation, though it's an important founding document, there was very little teeth to it. There was no federal government. We weren't really a unified country. In fact, the Artic Articles of Confederation was a, a much less authoritarian version of the EU. So think about it that way. Now, the difference in the EU is the EU was very authoritarian. The EU says, this is the kind of money that you're going to use. Uh, you're going to agree with us on all of these trade deals. And so EU was very authoritarian, 
the Articles of Confederation were sort of like that, but with significantly less teeth, and, and it couldn't tell the states what to do. It was basically a list of guidelines that the states just kind of agreed to. But there was no enforcement. There was no way to settle disputes between states. None of that stuff was put into effect. And so the purpose of the Constitution, because remember, the original purpose of the Constitutional Convention was not to make a Constitution. Now, it became that very quickly. It wasn't very long before they realized that. But the original purpose of that Constitution, or the Constitutional Convention, was to fix the Articles of Confederation, and eventually they realized, yeah, there's no way to fix this. We've got to come up with something different. But originally that was the idea because the Union was falling apart. We were not one unified country. And so the Constitution's purpose is to create a more perfect Union. There was Union among the states. There was a lot of like-mindedness, but there was no way to really unify us in any real tangible way. The Constitution was an attempt at doing that where the, the Articles of Confederation had failed. And then five tasks are given. Five tasks which summarize everything that the Constitution is going to do, everything that the Constitution sets out to do. We believe that these are the ways to accomplish these five tasks that we have seen as fit for a federal government to engage in. The first one is establish justice. Well, that makes sense because there are certain things that the states individually are incapable of doing. For example, if you have somebody that commits a crime in one state and then leaves that state and goes to another state, then that state really doesn't have jurisdiction over that person. That's why we have the Department of uh, Defense. That's why we have the, well, not the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, sorry. That's why we have the Department of Justice. That's why we have the FBI, to handle interstate crime. If we're going to be one nation, people need to not be able to just leave the country, essentially, by going from, you know, Massachusetts to New York. We can't have people doing that and then as a result of that, being able to get away with whatever crime that they have committed. That's why we need to establish justice. And by the way, this is something that is accomplished by the court system that is also set up in Article 3 of the Constitution. If there are crimes that take place between states, if the states themselves commit crimes, they need oversight in that sense. And so we have a Department of Justice in order to handle matters of that nature. We realized that that was going to be something that was important. And keep in mind that this is something that the founders would have gotten directly from the Bible. The scripture really only lists two purposes of government in the New Testament, and that is to punish the wicked and praise the good. That's it. Those are the only two mandates, which you, by the way, can find in the book of Romans, that the New Testament gives a, a government that they are supposed to be doing and so it makes sense that the very first one, especially for a group of Bible-believing people, they'd go, well, we've got to establish justice. We've got to have a way to punish those that do wrong and encourage those that do right, and justice accomplishes both of those things. The second one is ensure domestic tranquility. This is pretty, you know, obvious. Just keep the peace. We need a way to ensure that peace is kept between the states. We don't want states going to war with one another over some kind of dispute. We don't need, you know, like we're seeing today, unfortunately, uh, insane riots in the streets. We don't need people that are just not going to enforce laws that go are going to allow the states to devolve into anarchy. This, by the way, is one of the justifications for things like FEMA. The fact that the federal government, because states have the ability to help one another out to sort of facilitate that, and to aid states when there is some kind of natural disaster or something that is outside of their control for the federal government to come in and lend some assistance to try to reestablish order. That is also a purpose of government, is to ensure that there are not wicked people that do evil that would disturb the peace, and so ensure domestic tranquility. Now notice, it is specific to say domestic tranquility. We're not the world's police officers. We're not supposed to be going off and getting entangled into foreign affairs. In fact, our founders very, very stridently warned against that. But when it comes to domestic disputes, the federal government does have a responsibility to ensure that those things are handled. Now, of course, and you'll see this later on in the Constitution, and especially in the Tenth Amendment, that they believe that it should be handled at the lowest level possible until the federal government absolutely has to get involved because they are the last resort. However, there is still a responsibility if that is unable, if, if the local level or a lower level is unable or unwilling to do that, 
the federal government does have a responsibility to see that domestic tranquility is ensured. The third one is to provide for the common defense. Now, this is something that is argued back and forth a lot between the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist, because keep in mind, we won the Revolutionary War without technically having a federal army. Now, you know, we kind of had state armies, but most of the war was fought with militias. And so this is something that is debated pretty hotly in the Constitutional Convention. Do we need a standing army? Do we need to just have, you know, random people doing this like we did in the Revolutionary War? But here's the thing you have to remember. There was actually a standing army. There were people that were career soldiers living in the states that wound up fighting the British. But before they did that, they were British soldiers. And so one of the things that comes out in this debate is we've got to have some people officers, that kind of thing, that are ready and know the art of war and know how to lead people. Maybe we can rely on militias, and we'll see even later in the Second Amendment that they talk about militias specifically being something that is important to continue to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, keep the peace, and provide for the common defense, but we have to have some kind of infrastructure in place to keep those people ready and instruct them in how to act once that takes place, once there is some kind of wartime event that takes place. We didn't have a standing army for the most of our nation's history. We didn't have a large standing army the way that we did in Korea and Vietnam. We really only had that we really only started doing that after World War II. Once World War II took place, we started kind of hanging on to a lot of the military that we had. In every conflict before that, we would have a war come, and we, of course, had officers in the military, and we had some career soldiers. But the vast majority of the soldiers that filled our ranks were people that were either drafted or volunteered because they happened to be of that age, and the second that the war was over and there was no longer any need, they shut down what is commonly referred to as the military-industrial complex, of course, coined by Dwight D. Eisenhower, and everybody just kind of went back to their business. The only people that stayed in the military as career military people were officers and leaders and that kind of thing. And of course, there were some soldiers and privates, but it was relatively small compared to what it is today. And so they understood that the federal government, especially because they didn't want states warring with one another, it would be best if the federal government handled things for common defense, defense of the country. Now, if you want to handle something internally... That's why you have police. That's why individual states have their own Bureau of Investigations and Justice Departments and Attorneys General and that kind of thing. But ultimately, when it comes to the common defense, defense from foreign outside threats, that is something that is primarily done at the federal level through the military. You can even have individual National Guards. And remember that the governors of the states kind of act as the commander-in-chief for their individual National Guards, but when it comes right down to it, when it comes to us, the federal government is in charge of making sure that when it comes to foreign threats, that that is taken care of by the federal government, and that's the reason that this is put into the preamble. The fourth one, promote the general welfare. Boy, this one gets misconstrued all the time. Promote the general welfare is kind of the same things that we've been talking about, you know, making sure that the peace is kept, making sure that there are not people coming in from other places. Promoting the general welfare just means creating kind of an environment where people can work and thrive and that kind of thing. And, you know, there's some federal role in that. There's a reason that we have, for example, a state interstate system because we are doing something that creates the ability to travel between states. Uh, we, we do some regulation when it comes to things like licensing in the states. Uh, I think that our role is actually too big in that right now, but you know there is a role for the federal government to get involved. Unfortunately, normally what happens is because what we have, and, and this is brilliant marketing on the left's part, we have referred to welfare programs Things like taking money from some people to give to other people, we say, well, that's the general welfare. And a lot of people will use this part of the preamble to justify basically anything the federal government does. I actually had this discussion with a buddy of mine that uh, is very far on the left. And I was asking him because he said that the general welfare part of the preamble allows the federal government to do redistribution of wealth if they want to. And so my rebuttal to him was, so what is the federal government not allowed to do? Because we do have a Tenth Amendment that says that there are certain powers that are relegated to the states, and we have James Madison, the author of the Constitution, 
saying that the powers given to the federal government are small and defined, and the ones given to the states are numerous and indefinite. So if that's the case, how do you sync that with this idea that basically anything that benefits the people would be general welfare? And he didn't have an answer because there is no answer. The founders never intended this part of the Constitution to be a blank check to any program that the government wanted to enact. That was never what they wanted to happen based on the phrase general welfare. And here's another thing, too. Like I said at the beginning of this whole thing, the preamble is an introduction. And what the introduction is intended to do is to say, okay, here's the things that we're going to talk about here in the Constitution, and then when they get to the body after the introduction, these are the ways that you do them. Are we really supposed to believe that when they were talking about general welfare, what they really were talking about were giant entitlement programs, free health care for all, free college education, all of that stuff, and the founders just kind of forgot to put that in there, even though they put it in the introduction, they just somehow, oh, slipped my mind, I forgot all those giant social programs we were supposed to put in there. That's not realistic. When they say the general welfare, they're talking about the things that are in the Constitution, having a justice department having a president, having a Congress, uh, being able to regulate interstate commerce, being able to settle disputes between states, being able to tax, that kind of thing. All of those things are already included in the Constitution. You cannot say that because of a line in the preamble that that was a justification for doing all of the things on your wish list that you want the federal government to do. All of those things were already included in the Constitution originally. Now, there is a way to amend the Constitution. If you want to add one of those things, propose a constitutional amendment. That's the correct process in order to allow the federal government to do something it was originally not designed to do. You don't get to look at something that was already existing and saying, oh, the founders clearly meant that, uh, yeah, universal basic income. That's what it meant by general welfare. That's ridiculous. If they wanted to include that, they would have. And so this is unfortunately one part of the preamble that is often completely you know, misused and misapplied. And then the final one, the fifth one, secure the blessings of liberty. So there's a couple different facets to this one. Obviously, liberty was the primary function of the federal government. They wanted to preserve a person's rights. They wanted to preserve a person's life, protect them from harm, protect them from evil people, and they also wanted to make sure that man was as free as humanly possible. Now, he also bared the weight of the responsibilities of freedom, but they wanted to make men as free as possible. We see this in the big three tenets that are talked about in the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Property, if you're going by the Lockean way that he phrased it, and, and Thomas Jefferson's original draft actually uses property as well. So if that is the case, then ensuring the blessings of liberty would mean that not only are people guaranteed freedom under this Constitution, but also they are entitled to reap the benefits of that freedom if they use their freedom wisely to go out, serve their fellow man, make goods and services and products and labor that serves their community, then they are entitled to those blessings. They are able to reap the rewards of their good decisions. And that should be something that is allowed for them, allowed for their family. They can do with it what they want. So this is really that last one, the, the pursuit of happiness kind of clause. That's what the fifth task in this Constitution was given. That it is the blessings of liberty and that you're able to enjoy those blessings when you make good decisions and use your liberty wisely. And then finally, it gets to the for whom. Because we already talked about who. You remember, that was the very first thing that we did. We the people. So we the people are doing this, and then they give you all the things that they're planning to do, and then finally, after they state those five tasks, they get to the last part. Why are we doing this? Who are we doing this for? To ourselves, in other words, we the people, and our posterity. So children, generations to come, people that are yet unborn, the Constitution has often been referred to as a contract with those yet unborn. And this is part of the reason that it is seen that way. They specifically put that into the Constitution. By the way, it's also interesting to note that posterity, it could also be understood to be, you know, offspring or children, whatever you want to, you know, the common vernacular that you would like to throw in there. Keep in mind that that means that the rights of the unborn, that would be included too. 
even the ones that have not yet been conceived, even though, you know, conception is obviously the point at which life starts, obviously. But when it comes to this, they included the posterity as a part and a, a party to the rights that are guaranteed to human beings under the Constitution. So that's included as well. It's not just the people that were there at the signing of the Constitution or that were born and citizens of the country when the Constitution was put together. It's future generations. It's everybody. They intended for this thing to live on. And so that's a big part of this as well. And then finally, we get to the what. Finally, we get to the what, which is do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And so this is really just kind of a sign off, but it's important because they say we do ordain and establish. So it's not just that we establish it. We are ordaining it to future generations. We are putting it forward, as it were. We are sa sanctioning it and saying, these are the things that we believe. These are our principles. So we're establishing the government, but we also ordain it as a set of principles as well. The Constitution is a law, but it was never intended to just be a law. It's also intended to convey certain principles of limited power, maximizing liberty, those kinds of things. And so it's not just the establishment, it's also the ordaining part saying that these are the things that we believe this is a reflection of American values. Now, is it that to the extent that the Declaration of Independence is? No, because it is a practical, useful document. And like any other man-made document, including the Declaration, it does occasionally have flaws, but they're saying these are the values that we hold the most sacred. And so, of course, the United States of America, that being the country that it's established for, just to clear up in case there was any doubt on that. People ask me all the time, Caleb, how do you stay in such great shape? Well, let me tell you, it's not easy. The secret is a steady diet consisting mostly of likes and subscriptions, especially the ones where the person hits the notification bell. That's what actually gives me my superhuman strength. Likes, as it turns out, are very high in protein and iron. Sadly, doesn't do anything for your hair.